Good afternoon. Welcome to session 18, United Nations response to security challenges in Africa. Uh, the objectives of this session, one, to examine the work of the UN Department of Political Affairs, uh, Peace Building Affairs and the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, UNODA. Two, to explore the links between DPPA, uh, UN Department of Polit Political and Peace Building Affairs and UNODA, uh, United Nations Office of Disarmament, Member States, Rex, and AU on issues related to security. Three, to assess the impact of peace building activities on the continent and the rule of law and justice implications for taking a preventative approach to crisis, conflict, and instability. And four, to examine how strategic leadership and security sector leaders can make use of mechanisms available with uh, D DPPA and UNODA to deliver better security to state and citizens in Africa. To begin our conversation this afternoon, I have two distinguished panelists uh, that I call brothers and uh, uh, my brother and my sister. Uh, let me stop introduce, introducing Dr. Ibo uh, Adedeji. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I know both of them would have loved to join us in person, but uh, I think uh, something came up and so both of them are joining us online. Uh, let me start with Dr. Adedeji Ibo. He's currently the Chief Conventional Arm Branch, United Nations Office of Disarmament uh, since, 20, since March 2020. Uh, he was until then the pioneer Chief of the Security Sector Reform Unit, Office of the Rule of Law and Security Institution, Department of Peace Operation, United, New York, since August 2008. He also worked uh, in different assignments as the Director of Political Affairs at the UN Office for West Africa, and the Sahel, you know us, from 2017 to 2019, UN operations in Cote d'Ivoire uh, from 2015 to 2016, and the office, the UN office in Mali in 2013. Uh, prior to joining the UN, uh, Dr. Ibo was a senior fellow and founding head of Africa program at the Geneva Center for, uh, for Security S Sector Governance that we call DCAF. He was an associate professor and the head of the Department of Political Science and Defense Studies uh, at the Nigerian Defense Academy. He's an alumnus of the University of Kiel, England, where he received a BA in International Relations. He studied his uh, master's in polit uh, politics and world economy from the London School of Economics, and then a PhD in International Relations from the University uh, of Iro in Nigeria. Uh, his latest publication, uh, The United Nations and Security Sector Reform, Policy and Practice it was co-edited with Professor Heiner Hagi, published by the LIT Verlag in 2020, and we have it and we can share with, uh, with colleagues here. Our second panelist for this afternoon, uh, Mrs. Miss Awadabo, currently the Director and Deputy Head of the Peace Building Support Office at the United Nations in New York. Uh, Ms. Dabo is a human rights lawyer with extensive experience in crisis recovery, peace building, transnational justice, humanitarian affairs and development. Uh, Ms. Dabo has held several positions within the United Nations, including currently as the Chief of Country uh, Oversight and Support, UNDP Regional Bureau for Africa. Uh, Ms. Dabo was previously Senior Advisor and Head of the Crisis and Fragility Policy and Engagement Team for the Crisis Bureau of UNDP. She was also a Country Director for the UNDP in Tanzania and a regional program manager and team leader with UNDP Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery. Uh, during her professional career, Ms. Dabo has worked with the UN and non-UN entities, including the Office of the Coordination of Human, uh, Humanitarian Affairs, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and the African Society of International and Cooperative Law, uh, International Law NGO based in London, England. Uh, Ms. Dabo holds an LLM in International Human Rights Law from University of Nottingham and a BA in Law in Sociology and Social Anthropology from the University of uh, Kiel, Kiel. So to begin, we've asked uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ibo, that I myself I call uh, Fufuga, to, uh, to, to share some of his perspective uh, from uh, his office, uh, UNODA. So we've asked him to please describe the range of work that the UN uh, ODA office uh, is doing to address some of the security challenges in Africa. Uh, how does the UN ODA office support the African Union flagship initiative on uh, silencing the gun in Africa? 
and implementation of its policies, such as the defense and security policy, the security sector reform policy, the framework agenda 2063. Uh, we've also asked him uh, to share some of the strengths and the weaknesses of the UN, uh, his office, UNODA in particular, and in supporting the AU, the Rex and African governments to address security challenges uh, and some of the barriers and how to overcome such barriers. And I think finally, we've asked him to also share uh, uh, some discussion on uh, African security sector leaders uh, can do to leverage partnership with the UN and other uh, entities. So I will stop here. I'll give him the floor for about tw uh, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll move to uh, Ms. Uh, Dabo and I'll introduce her, her presentation as well. Uh, over to you, Fofoga. Thank you for the opportunity to address that issue. I'm very happy to share the chat from with my sister and colleague Aladabo. And thanks to you, I know now that both Awa and myself were at the meeting, but I didn't know that. Um, it takes two or three to know that. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I also want to ask for your generosity my voice is a bit as you know not what it usually sounds like because i'm <clears throat> struggling with uh, with covid but i couldn't resist the opportunity to you know to, to talk to acss people um so if i'm not my usual self that is because i'm actually not feeling well and that's why i'm dressed like an eskimo even though it's summer so my apologies um let me go directly to your questions why my energy level is still relatively high uh, in terms of the first question that was posed in terms of how UNODA uh, helps to address security challenges in Africa and how we support uh, the flagship initiative of the African Union silencing the guns. I think there are three main ways uh, in which UNODA supportive to the uh, The first is that we provide policy advice in line with international agreements and international standards. And when I say international standards, there are two standards here. On ammunition, we have something called the IATG, which is the international ammunition technical guidelines. We provide a body of work on how uh, UN member states, including African countries, can manage effectively and safely uh, ammunition in their possession. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in terms of what we have practically done. And secondly, for small arms, we have what we call mosaic. The modular small arms control implementation support compendium, which contains all the standards for how to manage small arms. So we provide advice and support on those two uh, standards. Secondly, UNODA is not per se an, uh, an implementing body, it's more of a policy body. But what we do practically uh, to support member states on the ground is that we have three regional centers. We have a regional center uh, in, in Africa, which is part of which is the UN Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Africa, called UNREC. It's an acronym. And is based in Lome in Togo, uh, created in 1986. It's one of three centers, three regional centers. We also have one uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, only REC, which is based in Lima in Peru, and a third one for Asia and the Pacific, which is, which is based in Kathmandu in Nepal. So the one for Africa is based in Lome, it's called only REC. And through, uh, it's called UNREC, sorry. And through UNREC, we support work on the ground. And I will come to that also in a little bit more detail later. The third way in which we support uh, work on the ground 
is by using the authority and the credibility of the United Nations to help member states to attract donor funding um, and implementing partners for implementation of projects that come from the African continent. So just to recap, um, provide policy and advice, we support through UNREC, our field um, presence in Africa based in Lome, and we also use our, our credibility, if you like, to help African member states to attract funding. Now, in addition to UNREC, uh, which is based in Lome in Togo, we also have an additional presence in Africa, uh, which is specific to weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it is called the 1540 Support Unit. Resolution 1540 was passed in 2004. Uh, specific to the area. So, the support unit is based in Addis and works on the areas of chemical, biological, nuclear. So, this is the two uh, on the continent. Now, to come down to what we do practically to support, um, for silencing the guns, UNODA has what is called the, uh, the Project on Amnesty Month. As you know, uh, the African Amnesty Month is part of silencing the guns. Uh, within the framework of the Lusaka Master Roadmap for well, implementing the silencing the guns, there are various activities and projects as well. And uh, silencing the guns is one of them. Um, the Amnesty Month is usually in September of every year. Uh, and we have specific to that. Um, there was a resolution in 2019, uh, Security Council Resolution 2457. Uh, which actually provides the framework for supporting the AU on silencing the guns. Now, the silencing the guns is the broad uh, initiative, as you know. We focus for now on um, Amnesty Month. We, in 2020, had this in seven beneficiary states in Burkina Faso, in the Central African Republic, in Cameroon, in Cote d'Ivoire, in DRC, in Ethiopia, and in Kenya. And the idea of uh, Amnesty Month is that all those civilians who have illicit possession of firearms can hand over these illicit arms under conditions of anonymity and immunity from prosecution. Um, and in 2020, we were supposed to collect, we were able to uh, collect and destroy more than 2,000 weapons through Amnesty, Africa Amnesty Month. In 2021, uh, we did this in three countries, in Madagascar, in Niger, and in Uganda. And we were able to collect and destroy about 1,500 weapons. In 2022, which is this year, the project will support three countries, namely Liberia, Tanzania, and Togo. In addition to uh, silencing the guns, we also have um, in Africa what you call salient, that is the saving lives entity which actually is um, part of the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament, which we have in partnership with, UN, uh, with UNDP, um, and actually is located within the UN Peace Building Fund, uh, where AWA is working. Uh, it's part of the, uh, the, uh, the peace building architecture of the UN and uh, the peace building fund helps us to manage the funding of the project. And the idea through Salient is to have small arms uh, projects that are more comprehensive uh, 
um, under the under the guidance of the UN resident coordinator. And so far, we have a project on salient in Cameroon. We have one also a project in South Sudan. Um, and this year, we are, we are going to consider probably having additional projects uh, in Togo as well. We also have a fund called the UNSCAP, UN Trust Facility Supporting Cooperation on Arms Regulation, uh, which is more for, um, I would say retail small arms work. So if you want to think, think of salient as a broader wholesale approach, uh, UNSCAP is actually for catalytic support, uh, smaller funding around two hundred thousand um, dollars, you know, which would which would create, create a basis for hopefully broadening relations. So that would be one of UNSCA. and many African countries have received funding uh, from UNSCA. We also have the EU-funded project, uh, which is called supporting gender mainstream policies programs and actions in the fight against small arms and uh, small arms trafficking and misuse in line with the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, we've had this for actually quite a few years and this year the, the EU agreed to extend this uh, for another five years, I believe. Now, going back to the um, standards I mentioned, I talked about the International Ammunition Technical Guidelines, IATG. You may have heard that in 2021, there was an explosion in Equatorial Guinea in a place called Bata, uh, which is actually the uh, smallest, biggest town in that country. And through um, that, we actually, as ODA, intervened to do an assessment of uh, what led to the explosion, and provide a framework for the government to address that. We have, as part of the IATG, we have what we call the Ammunition Management Advisory Team, which is based in Geneva, and which is which we deploy uh, when needed. In the case of Equatorial um, Guinea, this was deployed. Uh, it was in March 2021. Um, and, but that was after the explosion. As a preventive intervention, we had another one in Togo a couple of months later where the Togolese government had approached us that they had concerns about the conditions of storage of their weapons and ammunition. Uh, and we deployed uh, our AMAT uh, colleagues to go there to do an assessment. Uh, and we were able to advise the Togolese government on how better to store ammunition. Now, uh, in terms of your second question about the strengths and weaknesses of the UN uh, and ODA in particular in supporting the AU, I mentioned to you that we are uh, focused for now on amnesty month. Now, that is not sufficiently strategic. We should be having a much more strategic intervention uh, beyond just the amnesty month. And it, actually, I think it was last month, there was a conversation between the African Union Commissioner for Peace and Security and the UN Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs to explore how to use amnesty month as an entry point for a much more strategic intervention in silencing the guns, whereby uh, the African Union would advise us on what additional areas within the uh, Lusaka Master Roadmap uh, the UN can help to support the African Union. Uh, so we are working on Amnesty Month. It is good, but it's not sufficient for a much more strategic intervention. Secondly, the challenge we face is that in supporting the RECs, as you know, no. the rest in Africa are on even capacity. Uh, so that itself also is a challenge. Uh, thirdly, you know, 
the UN can only provide global norms. Uh, the issue of national ownership is something that is, I think, uh, admitted by all as being essential, but there is no common way uh, to, to implement it. The issue of national ownership has been a challenge, including financing uh, of this of this project. I would talk more about security sector reform, uh, hopefully in the Q&A. As you know, uh, Joel, this is my area of passion, uh, even though I'm no longer working on it. But I should say already here that one of the challenges we face beyond the summit on security sector reform is that the UN can only intervene on security sector reform in two contexts. One, one is either uh, security sector reform has been recommended by a security council resolution uh, under chapter seven, which means that we do SSR where we have peacekeeping uh, forces. The second condition is where the country itself is voluntarily requesting UN support. Um, otherwise, you know, there is nothing the UN can do. Either the peacekeeping resolution or the country itself has requested UN support on SSR. Uh, and that is that can be quite limiting. Um, then in terms of the the last question, how can security sector leaders leverage strategic partnerships within the UN? I would say that first, I think African security sector leaders need to um, familiarize with themselves with the regional frameworks in Africa that exist on the security sector. As you know, or might know, uh, the African Union adopted a continental security sector reform and governance framework in 2013. That had a lot of input from the United Nations. Uh, I know because I was working in that area at the time. But my observation is that the AU SSR policy framework is little known uh, to my uniform brothers and sisters, and have been witnessing very uneven, uh, maybe very even low profile implementation. I think uh, more attention to that would be useful. Um, I also think that because of the reality that UN cannot support African countries except in peacekeeping on SSR, uh, I encourage our colleagues to advocate what you can call national action plans on security sector reform based on national conditions. Uh, and as I've said already, I also think that on this armament, we need to go beyond uh, the specific area of Amnesty Month to go more broader. But as I always say, Joel, you know, um, I think on security sector, the first task that we need to do uh, is to demystify the security sector. The security sector in Africa is too much of a mystery, sometimes even a mystique to ordinary people. You know, uh, if you want to scare children, tell them you're going to call the police and they're all going to be afraid. You know, we need to demystify the security sector, bring them closer to the people. Uh, we need to also, uh, I think, devise a much more preventive agenda for the security sector. And we need to admit also the hybridity of the security sector in Africa. You know, we have security sector state institutions, but our societies are not Western societies. There is a mix between the formal state structures and the traditional customary uh, practices and institutions on the ground. That's why I call it the hybridity. I think we need to admit more this hybridity. And lastly, and I'll keep quiet after this, I honestly think that we should more, work more uh, concentratedly on developing a code of conduct, a common code of conduct for African uh, security forces and uh, 
uh, and service personnel so that if you go from Togo to Zimbabwe, you, an African should expect the same kind of conduct uh, from, from their uh, uniformed personnel. So sorry, I'm a bit incoherent because I'm struggling with COVID, but I hope at least that has been somehow slightly useful. Back to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ibo, for such an uh, elaborate uh, discussion. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Awa Dabo. Uh, Ms. Dabo, uh, we've asked Ms. Dabo three questions. Uh, first of all, the first one is, uh, since the release of the Pathways for Peace reports in 2018, the UN approach to peace and conflict has been more uh, prevention focused and people centered. Why is this the case? What evidence is there to highlight from the report that explained this approach. Second, what has been the impact of the UN peace building uh, activities on the continent for African security? And how do consideration like gender mainstreaming in the security sector, women peace and security and youth peace and security agenda fit in the current peace building approach? And how can African security sector leaders uh, here leverage partnership with the peace building support office uh, where you belong to advance people-centered approaches to confront the security challenges and uh, threat face in Africa. Over to you, Ms. Dabo. Thank you so much and um, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank you, the Africa and the Pursuit Security Discovery for this invitation, this opportunity to speak to emerging security sector leaders from Africa. And to say, you know, I really regret not being able to be there. I had, of course, planned to be there, but, you know, as these things happen, something, something comes up. And so, um, contribute um, virtually. And, and again, maybe to, to, um, to sort of repeat um, Adedeji's point about you know, the fact that, you know, it, it took us coming here to realize that we actually alumni of the university in, in England, um, which is Kiel. So, but thank you very much. And also to say that I'm very pleased to contribute to this important learning event and to share some pointers on the UN's approach to responding to security challenges in Africa, specifically within the context of prevention and peace building. And I hope we can have you know, good discussions. I look forward to hearing views and expectations from the participants in the room. So um, the role of rule of law and security institutions for any country's stability, not only in Africa, Africa. Uh, country stability and for peace cannot be overstated. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, in 2018, the UN and the World Bank issued a joint report um, which collected evidence and analyzed policy responses in several countries to identify what we feel can place countries on the pathways for peace. The report um, found that accountable, responsive and inclusive security institutions are actually one of the most critical elements to addressing drivers of conflict and violence. The findings of the report have further advanced the UN's approaches to security sector governance and to reforms. So, and just a few months ago, in fact, the UNSG pointed out in his report on strengthening security sector reform that robust security institutions that provide protection to all groups in society are an integral part of genuine um, stability. So I think it's pretty clear to us certainly, and I'm sure to all of you, that the work you do is integral to the work on, on, on sustained peace and, 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 uh, and peace building and also, of course, on, on prevention. But maybe first, let me quickly reflect very quickly on the changing nature of the conflicts, um, of the challenges we are facing in peace building, because indeed, um, the world is changing and the world is changing and impacting not only in Africa, it's impacting on, on, on everybody, on all of us. I mean, the challenges we're now facing in peace building have become much more complicated and they become much more interlinked. They are already, see, we see that they are compounding or building on already complex issues that many countries within the Africa region are facing and also elsewhere they are facing. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on economies and societies, we are still, you know, we're still dealing with that in the Africa continent. On top of that, we now have the Ukraine crisis, which has made it even much worse, um, including impacting on food security in some of our countries and also increasing the, the risks of fragility. Uh, we also see that there is a worrying trend to distract from crises that's happening ongoing with a focus, an increasing focus of attention and resources to, to the Ukraine crisis. And this is something that uh, us in my office, we, we really, are very forceful in, in, in raising attention and advocating that we cannot forget the fact that crises continue 
um, irrespective of Ukraine. And in fact, if we continue to, um, to pull resources and, and respond only to Ukraine, we are going to be compounding already um, existing fragilities. At the same time, we're also finding, um, as far as the context, that national democratic institutions are increasingly under threat. That the trust that citizens, that should exist between citizens and populations and their governments are becoming even more strained and also becoming even strained between citizens and the institutions, national institutions that they should, that should support them. That's becoming undermined through this, um, what we see to be a, a real increasing um, 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 challenges as far as governance in the African continent. Um, we see that criminal and terrorist networks are taking full advantage of this, and, and they're really working hard to so continue to sow division and conflict in, uh, in many of the countries that we are working. We also see climate change, and this is um, nowhere more so than the African continent. Climate change is a threat to livelihoods, it's a threat to peace and security, and the impact will only intensify with fear. And, and we fear that many of these countries already um, suffering from crisis or fragility or conflict will only suffer more if we don't address the issue of climate change and how it's impacting on populations and, and communities. So overall, violent conflict has really surged. We, from where we sit working on peace building, we've seen that in, this la in the past decade, there has been a surge of violent conflict in the world. The number of co conflicts, violent conflicts in 2020 was at its highest since 1945. With a right. terrible consequence, the terrible consequence of human lives. People are, are being killed and livelihoods are being lost. And, and, um, and although we, we see it or even report it, um, um, predictably, it's women who continue to suffer the most disproportionately, both at home as well as in the, pub, uh, in the public sphere. So we, are, we see that we are facing multiple risks, and these are risks that frequently transcend national borders. These risks don't only exist within our, within our countries, but they also cross across borders, and they add to the complexities of, 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 of the conflict. In Africa, for example, you know, we all, those of us who come from the Sahel region, and I come, I come, come from the Sahel region, we see that we are facing tensions between farmers and herders, and these are exacerbated by climate change, and they often tr trigger other types of crises, for example, the movement of population and population displacement. Communities that are already facing governance deficits, meaning they don't have government presence where, the, where they are, they already don't have access to basic services. These are all increasing challenges we find that we are facing in the region. And we find local um, communities, lots of local grievances, people feeling marginalized, they don't feel that they're being included in the development trajectory in their countries. And these are all creating new conditions for more conflicts you know, root causes for more conflicts. And we uh, added to this are the extremist groups who also are very good at taking advantage of vulnerabilities, of unhappiness within populations. So it is within these contexts, you know, of a changing operating environment, including the continued tensions around multilateralism and the multiple megatrends around climate security and technological threats that we as the UN, we want to work, we look to work with government institutions, with civil society, with IFIs, with private sector and other key stakeholders to see how we can collectively address prevention and peace building. And we see this as important, as center to, to what, what we call, what, when we talk about sustainable development, when we talk about peace and when we talk about security. The UN's peace building approaches is, is evolving. Our approaches continue to evolve. And we, we do this by, by, by looking at peace building, not as a singular issue, but as, a, as an issue that is within these compounding security challenges. And we do it using a prevention lens. So our work in peace building at, at, at country level, when we do our programs and our projects, uh, even here in New York, when we have our discussions with political um, 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 entities or IFIs, you know, the World Bank, IMF, private sector, we make sure we do it with a view towards prevention. So I work, um, I work in, um, in, the, in the UN's Peace Building Support Office. And the Peace Building Support Office fits within or sits within U, U, um, the UN's Department for Political and Peace Building Affairs, what we call the Peace and Security Pillar of the UN. The UN, as you know, has many different pillars. There's a Peace and Security Pillar, Development Pillar, Humanitarian uh, Pillar, and we sit in the Peace and Security Pillar. And the Peace Building Support Office, otherwise which we call the P um, PBSO, is in fact a lead actor within the UN working on prevention and peace building. Through our leadership role, we work to ensure that the UN is coherent in its approach to peace building. We, the, the, the fact that the UN is, pri is prioritizing prevention and peace building is just an indication of the level of importance that this organization places on it. So whether we work in conflict context or not, we in the UN understand that prevention and peace building are essential 
to development, and they're essential to um, attaining the sustainable development goals. It's essential to ensuring that we have inclusive development for all the people with whom we work. So our approach to peace building is multifaceted. There are many different elements to it. They, in, they incorporate many elements and many actors, and uh, each of these actors are brought in to bring in their added value, to bring in their strengths. So broadly speaking, uh, the UN's approach to peace building um, includes the following. So first, we have a focus on prevention and early warning. So we, we, of course, we have to ensure that whatever approaches or whatever projects and programs we put in place speak to or address some of the root causes of why the conflict happened in the, in the first place. And, and this is all with a view to, ensure, to avoiding a relapse um, into conflict. Secondly, uh, approaches ensures is an effort to stabilize and to protect peace building and development gains. So where we come into countries and we want to um, um, implement projects and programs, we also want to stabilize the, the, the context. And we also want to ensure that we, ben we, we, we benefit and we maintain the gains we've already made, whether it's in peace building or development. Um, thirdly, our actions and strategies also speak to national ownership and ensure sustainability and, and SDGs. And this is very important, particularly for you and for the government. No peace can last. Peace cannot be sustained by interventions by the UN alone. It is very well understood that if we, if we really have to talk about peace building in the long term, it has to be owned by, the, by national authorities and local authorities, and it has to be led by national authorities. So we do not do peace building without government, obviously, but importantly, we also ensure that all our peace building interventions are aligned to government's priority, priorities in a given country. Fourthly, we are very big on strategic partnerships, not only within the UN, but outside of the UN. So not only with governments, but we, when we talk about peace, you have to also talk about the key actors with whom you want to work, whether it's private sector, civil society, and in our, many of our countries, importantly, civil society, not only at national level, but at subnational level, those who are the communities who really understand the issues, who are what we call the frontline workers, how to ensure that they are also part of the discussion when talking about peace building. And finally, on advocacy and awareness, um, ensuring that there's a South-South approach to peace building, we're ensuring that we're moving, uh, get pushing for political will. So we are getting um, alliances, not only internally within the country, but also because many of the country, the conflicts are sub-regional and regional, bringing in other governments to be part of the discussion to see how we can collectively have uh, national and regional strategies to address um, peace building challenges. So an effective peace building response would definitely necessitate um, using several or all of these above. And central to it will, like I said, depends primarily on national ownership and on will. And this will depend on the role of national institutions, most of whom we need to lead and contribute and or sustain government's peace building priorities. Key to this response is the role of the security sector to restore peace and to prevent conflict. Through its work, the UN recognizes this, and it is due to this that increasingly many of our peace building activities specifically target security sector related programs and activities. Traditional peace and security approaches such as peacekeeping and mediation efforts are of course really important, but they are not always possible and they are rarely sufficient on their own. They need to be complemented by a strong and more comprehensive prevention and peace building offer. The Secretary General has, has highlighted this in calling for the new agenda for peace as part of this broader vision of our common agenda. So this concept of sustaining peace, which was defined in 2016 by the twin resolutions of the General Assembly and the Security Council, requires an approach that is comprehensive and that works across, works across our work on, on peace and security, on development, on human rights, and humanitarian, and, and humanitarian action. It also asks for a prevention approach, and it, it applies across the peace continuum. In other words, to prevent an outbreak of conflict against a relapse into conflict, we have to work to see how we can best consolidate lasting peace. Within PBSO, um, here at PBSO, we are dedicated to working on, on, on the UN's, this work on sustaining peace. And the Africa region is a number one our number one partner and our number one priority. As, uh, as Adi David said, we here manage um, the UN's Peace Building Fund, and this is the UN's financial instrument first resort to sustain peace in countries and any situations that, that, that is at risk, risk and that are afoid, um, affected by violent conflict. From, 20, from 2017 to 2021, 
the UN peace building funds investment in Africa represented 72% of its total investment. So Africa is by large the largest um, um, investment for us. In 2021 alone, our fund provided support to 25 countries in Africa, totaling 151 million US dollars. Several PBF projects support community-based violence reduction. We support security sector reform, and we work on strengthening trust with populations and state authorities, as well as improving cross-border relations. Um, PBSO is also a thought leader and a partnership enabler across the peace, development, and human rights and humanitarian act um, actors. For example, we have led the development of youth peace and security agenda, recognizing the important role that young people have to play in peace building. We work to generate more alignment between the UN and the international um, financial institutions, such as the World Bank, on prevention and building resilience. And we strengthen cooperation with regional organizations, for example, like the African Union, which is also one of our key strategic objectives. We also work closely with what we call the Peace Building Commission. And the Peace Building Commission is a commission based here in New York, which brings together member states who to support nationally owned peace building efforts. Since its inception, the Peace Building Commission has engaged 16 African context, country contexts to support peace building strategies at national and regional level. We address a whole range of issues, including political, socioeconomic, and security challenges. And this year, for example, we've been working on Cote d'Ivoire and DRC, and we organize security sector reform, um, work meetings around security sector reform and on DDR. So let me, at this point, I just want to stress that I've already mentioned um, above, and which is that none of these responses will um, to these very complex security um, challenges will work unless the government is ready uh, to take a leading role in prevention and in peace building. The recent proliferation of changes of government in Africa, for example, is really concerning um, um, where, for example, in some of these countries, the international community and the UN, we've invested quite significantly to strengthen governance and to, to work on issues of rule of law. So this is first and foremost detrimental and we are concerned and we together we work with government and work with civil society to see how best we can certainly address some of these issues and to work on ensuring that we're talking about really implementing on peace programs in, a, in the long term. We need institutional reforms and capacity building to go hand in hand with dedicated efforts that will really improve on state and society relations, relations between government and the citizens and to reinforce social contracts um, um, between the people and the state. And we can do this by recognizing the local um, approaches and acknowledging and combining the role of central government, but also looking at how best we can work with customary and traditional forms of government that, that are you know, embedded in community life and are really important to many Af um, Africans and, and, and as, far as, long as, as, as far as addressing issues of exclusion as well as marginalization. Peace building and prevention are actively, also actively empower women and youth, and the Peace Building Fund works to ensure that these two constituents in particular are, are supported to participate in any peace building process that we support. But let me just conclude by building on the consideration that one of the core tools of prevention and peace building is a transformation of public sector institutions to make them more resilient and responsive in addressing the inequality and injustice and exclusion. And as security sector leaders, you can make a critical contribution to sustaining peace by strengthening the social contract between the government and its population through inclusive security delivery, which ultimately will meet the needs of the people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ms. Dabo, for your presentation.